Hello, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone watching us today. Uh, my name is Alexander Kuzmanovic, and today this is a really special session that we are having. I am joined by 10 extraordinary health scientists as WHO has established its first science council um, that met today for the first time. Um, the, the reason why WHO has created this council is to advance our scientific uh, work, but also to be better prepared to predict where we need more research uh, and scientific work um, in on health issues. Um, the Science Council is uh, chaired by Dr. Harold Varmus, who is a Nobel Prize winner in 1989 for medicine. And um, I'm really honored to be joined by him, by, doc by Dr. Sumia, our chief scientist, and nine more scientists from whom you will hear today. Um, as usual, please feel free to ask your questions. If you're watching us on Twitter using the hashtag AskWHO, if you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, please uh, leave your comments, um, why, leave your questions by, by a comment section. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm wishing good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to, to our uh, scientists um, as they are all over the world. And um, I would like to ask Dr. Sumia and Dr. Harold, the chair of the council, what is the objective of the council? And how did the first meeting today go? What will be your first tasks? Thank you, Alex, and greetings to everyone from WHO. You know, as you know, that science has never been so critical for addressing challenges to global health as we've seen in the past year, from you know the sequencing that first described this new virus, this new pathogen, to the development of diagnostic tests, as well as vaccines that are now saving lives around the world, it is science that has actually provided the solutions for us. The world has many more challenges that we have to face in terms of our, of our health issues. And WHO is in a very unique position, being you know, with 194 member states and having this tremendous uh, and unique advantage of being able to convene the world's experts. And that's what we see today as well. We've got the world's top experts in different areas coming together to form the Science Council to advise the Director General and advise WHO in, uh, in a few key areas. So it, it was really thought of as part of the transformation of WHO that started in 2018 as a way of making us really fit for purpose, fit for the future, looking ahead, uh, responsive to needs, harnessing the uh, advances in science and technology for public good, for public health, and being ahead of the curve. These are some of the thoughts that Dr. Tedros had when he set up the science division, the position of the chief scientist, and then we've created the science council to really advise the organization on what are those cutting edge technologies? What do we need to be aware of in the coming years, in the next five to 10 years that can have big impacts on our health? whether it's on prevention or whether it's on diagnosis or treatment of diseases. So just to summarize the goals of, of why this council has been appointed and what we expect from them, they will evaluate high priority scientific issues and provide input and guidance on translating them to public health guidelines. So we want to link science and public health very closely. Secondly, to identify the emerging areas in science and technology that we need to address, which include global health threats, because all of us are thinking about the pandemic, but there are other global health threats that we need to think about that will have an impact in the future on our health. Thirdly, to provide strategic direction to WHO's work in science, research, and innovation. And that's very much part of our DNA. It's part of our constitution when we were created in 1948. And fourthly, to participate as needed in the review of WHO's normative products. All the guidelines and standards that we produce um, would benefit from the advice that these top global experts uh, provide to us. And I want to quote uh, what Dr. Tedros said earlier when he was addressing the council that just met uh, in the afternoon here. 
Uh, of course, we met virtually uh, and people have connected from different parts and I'm grateful that some have got up extremely early in the morning and some have stayed up late in the evening to be with us. Uh, Louis Pasteur once said, science knows no country because knowledge be belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. So the goal here is to harness that knowledge and to harness the best minds to advise us on the future. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Harold Varmus to maybe say a little bit about the first meeting today and the direction in which the council is going. Well, thank you, Simia. And I think I speak for all of my colleagues when I say how delighted and honored we are to have been invited to participate in this council. Uh, the council we see as uh, uh, encapsulating a, a very important theme, that is that science not only knows no national boundaries, it doesn't, it doesn't respect disciplinary boundaries either. And in this case, we see that uh, the kinds of um, observations we can make about the progress of science can be applied to all forms of, of health and disease. Um, and we are we are cognizant of uh, Dr. Tedros's uh, interest in improving the health of billions of people by uh, improving the way they live, healthy habits, and uh, bringing science to the the um, the fight against a disease that affects people throughout the world in many different forms. So we see ourselves as people who have. Uh, our own set of expertise in, in, uh, in different parts of science, bringing those uh, aspects of science to bear on a wide variety of problems. Uh, we spent our first meeting in a very congenial conversation about how we can be of help to the World Health Organization and to people who live in the 194 countries represented by the WHO. Uh, in particular, we focused most of our conversation on the role that uh, the genomic technologies, the study of, of uh, our genetic blueprint and how that blueprint is exercised in, in development and disease, uh, to think about uh, how we might um, not simply um, advance the technologies, but to use those technologies in productive and helpful ways to try to achieve some of the goals that Dr. Tedros is trying to achieve in his billion time three um, initiative. Um, we focus particularly on um, the application of, uh, of genomic methods in the context of the pandemic, but we also kept in mind and emphasized as well, the prospect for improving uh, our ability to cope with many other diseases, cancers, chron other chronic diseases, uh, other kinds of infectious diseases, um, in a way that uh, that makes equitable use of the knowledge that cancer that that science has generated. All of us on this council have been trained um, in in some specialty of science, and many of us have done that with the hope that uh, the, the the fruits of science would be uh, enjoyed by all who inhabit this planet. Yet we know that uh, the, that the distribution of, of the products of science have not been equitable. And uh, we are thinking in uh, by taking on a project that addresses uh, the means for better use, better access to uh, the, uh, the techniques of uh, modern genomics for people who suffer from a wide range of hereditary, infectious, chronic diseases, as well as the current pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumia and uh, Dr. Harold. Um, Dr. Harold just mentioned uh, genomics as, as one of area of, of work that is potentially huge. Um, we have Dr. Edith, who is a molecular biology expert. We have Dr. Mary Claire, who is genome science and medicine expert. And we have Dr. Yong Youth, who is genetic engineer and biotechnology expert. So maybe one of you could tell us more, how can genomics particularly improve lives of people in all countries around the world? And some examples of disease or conditions that could be cured or prevented use, using those technologies. Maybe Edith, you could come in. Yes, okay, sorry, yes. Thank you um, for that question. I think uh, my other colleagues as well could definitely say a few words. I mean, in terms of genomics, I think, you know, basically the pandemic has really shown us um, how important this has been. You know, how can we know what the virus is about, how it's evolving, 
how it's being transmitted in different contexts. And I think that, you know, the infectious disease is clearly one area where genomics um, is absolutely central and developing ways to be able to share the data um, as quickly as possible. So we're sharing knowledge and actually acting on it from a societal and clinical perspective. So I think the pandemic has been a real eye opener for, for the power of genomics. But before that, um, for example, in cancer, it's been transformational. And maybe, maybe I can um, ask Mary Claire to say a few words about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Edith. Dr. Mary Claire, do you hear us? Don't think she's on the call, but uh, let me pitch in here if, if I may. Um, so our understanding of, of cancer over the last 50 years or so has been, uh, as, uh, as Edith was saying, has been transformed by our understanding that, that uh, <clears throat> at the core of cancer is a, is a genetic set of genetic changes that uh, alter the behavior of cells. And um, without going into detail, it's not, um, it's not uh, extravagant to say that uh, the way we diagnose cancer, a responsibility that, that WHO has held over the years, the way we categorize cancers is now increasingly based on the genetic changes that are found in cancer cells. New therapies, uh, means of prevention are based on genetic risk factors and on the actual mutations that are found. Um, our understanding of how the immune system responds to cancer is based on our recognition of uh, the, the, the changes and the multiplicity of changes that are found in cancer cells. So uh, that's one example of a chronic disease that uh, in which our ability to reduce risk, um, increase prevention, uh, improve therapy, uh, even in the absence of a complete cure can be um, uh, assisted dramatically by the application of genomics. But we know that genomics is not applied uh, with equal uh, efficiency and, uh, and access in all parts of the world. And one of the things that our group hopes to do is to think about ways in which uh, the access to these uh, new technologies and can be improved by improving the technologies, making them less expensive and uh, improving the, the workforce that uh, uses them in, in developing countries. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Edith and Dr. Harold. Um, what can this council do to provide guidance that will bring application of these technologies forward in an equitable way? Maybe Dr. Young Youth would like to take this one. Can you repeat the question, please? What can this council do uh, to provide guidance that will bring application of these technologies forward in an equitable way? Well, the council can uh, can really kind of um, think about means that the genomics and other sciences you know, can be used to uh, fight diseases like this pandemic, you know, um, and uh, vaccines, diagnostics, and drugs that can be uh, uh, come from use of genomics technology and not just genomics, but also other, other technologies that are available from science. Uh, uh, you know, also emergency medicine and other areas which are impacted by the disease, you know, uh, also really need a lot of science. We show, we, we can see from the example of vaccines that they can be developed very quickly, showing that science can help solve new problems provided, provided that enough of background knowledge is available so um, I think that uh, other areas as well, and not just genomics and medical science, other areas like IT and online communication and so on, uh, they should help in predict, uh, predicting new pandemics in the future and solving you know, the present pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would maybe anyone else like to, to add anything about equitable access to new technologies to improve people's lives. And there was a question that we received about how countries and civil societies can, can help us in making science and technology more accessible to, to people. Perhaps I'll jump in here, Alex, just to say that it's quite important that as we look at new technologies, that it's not just the applications of those technologies, but we need to move towards a, a situation of 
equitable involvement in development. So the research and development that goes into it needs also to be equitably distributed. We've seen how, for example, in the pandemic, that Africa was pushed to the back of the queue because the technologies were not there. And the ability to manufacture vaccines was not available in Africa. So we've got to address that. And I think it's part of a broader issue that we've got to be developing the ability to develop, use, and apply technologies across the board in a manner that's equitable. And the Africa and the lower and middle income countries need to be part and parcel of developing that capability further. Maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Pap uh, to come in because he's had this amazing experience in Haiti when he first went back and he found such a high mortality just from diarrhea in young children. So things that are people don't die of anymore in the developed world and yet kill you know, millions of children and adults in the, in the developing world. How can we use science and understanding of, of disease um, bill to address some of these big public health challenges? Yeah, I think this is very important because uh, it's called in a way implementation science. Uh, in Haiti, for instance, uh, a lot of kids were dying because they were dehydrated. And by bringing oral rehydration fluids, we were able to reverse that situation totally by bringing down the overall national mortality to 50% of what it was. Uh, so this is very, very important. The same for tuberculosis. They are new diagnostic tests, molecular biology tests. A gene expert, for instance, the diagnosis that could take two months now takes one hour and a half. And you're diagnosing also the most resistant, difficult to treat type of tuberculosis. So I think what we need essentially is to uh, offer more capacity building in terms of laboratory, uh, staff training and resources to developing countries so that they can achieve the same type of uh, uh, results that you see in developed countries. Thank you so much. And uh, we have also uh, Dr. Professor Adiba who would like to supplement on this question. Yeah, I, I just want to support what uh, Bill and, and Slim have said uh, around um, making sure that you know this new technology not only are accessible, but we're part of the development of that. And for that to happen, um, there needs to be uh, capacity building. And I think the role of the Science Council would to would be, I guess, first of all, to identify where the gaps are and um, and provide a, a global framework on how we can rapidly build this capacity. Um, I, you know, I think WHO has established a very exciting new um, institute of which I'm also a part of, the WHO Academy, who's whose uh, role is um, to build capacity all over the world. And I think um, we, we can perhaps look at some synergy there, uh, Sumia, for some of the things that we try to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Professor. Um, how, Dr. Slim mentioned the, some applications for COVID-19 pandemic. So maybe we, you can elaborate a little bit more on how has science contributed so far to the pandemic response? and what are the lessons from some scientific experiences in epidemic crisis before that were very helpful in this pandemic? Dr. Perhaps Singh, would you just, like to start? Uh, yeah, perhaps I'll just use three examples. So it's because of our preparatory activities and all of the work that had been done to expand the availability of diagnostic testing for HIV that we were able to pivot very rapidly to be able to do large-scale COVID testing. It's exactly the same machines. It's PCR technology we use to measure vital load for HIV. We're now using it for COVID. Similarly, if you take vaccines, take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's based on an adenoviral 26 vector. That vector was developed and is being tested in parallel right now. Uh, as an HIV vaccine. And we've seen you know, throughout Africa, take, just take South Africa, we've been involved in uh, five different vaccine trials 
And uh, all because we have very substantial HIV vaccine trial capacity that pivoted to doing this. So whether it's in research, whether it's in diagnostics, or whether it's in vaccine development, we've seen how all of the capacity built for HIV was now able to pivot and help in the response to COVID-19. I'll ask Adiva to comment because she's got a broader experience in this area as well. No, I think I actually look in envy, uh, Slim, at um, the capacity built around HIV uh, in Africa, which I must say is um, not as advanced um, in, in my part of the world. So, um, and uh, as, as you highlighted, it has, um, you know, benefited in other diseases as well. So we need to look at, as, as mentioned earlier, where the gaps are and where the council can help um, you know, fill those gaps up. Dr. Harold would like to supplement as well. Well, I just would like to point out something that's probably obvious to everybody on this panel, and that is that uh, while it's very important to take advantage of experience with one application, such as to HIV, to another, but it, similarly, it's also important to remember that, that some of the things we're talking about here, the new approaches to vaccines, to, to testing uh, uh, are um, embedded in a deeper, more basic kind of research in which we try to understand how the instructions for building a biological entity like a human being are laid down in our genomes, how we've learned to, uh, to uh, amplify the DNA using a, a combination of enzymes and machines, uh, how we've learned to take apart viruses and put them back together to make novel kinds of vaccines. Uh, so there's an element here of uh, making making use of uh, very fundamental science that uh, hopefully will be uh, practiced throughout the world, but for the moment is tends to be focused uh, largely in the most developed countries. Uh, and uh, one of our jobs as a council is to be looking out for new developments in fundamental science that could be applied to uh, to um, deep and drastic problems in, throughout the world that uh, currently don't uh, see the advantages that we hope we can provide by offering um, examples of places in, in the world where uh, we're um, exploiting those new technologies that may emerge from very basic research uh, can be used for the betterment of uh, health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harold. We also have uh, Professor Abla, who is epidemiologist from Lebanon. Um, Professor Abla, would you like to maybe share some experiences uh, from, from your work on how science has helped in epidemic crisis and maybe some lessons taken now into, into pandemic response? Yes, thank you. So science, science is, is, uh, is expensive, okay? There's a lot of investment when we want to produce the knowledge. So one message maybe I would like to put over here is that we need to be very efficient in terms of how we use the science and how we use the knowledge and how to translate the knowledge into practice. And over here, sharing of data and sharing of the knowledge and collaboration and twinning between different institutions and between uh, developed and developed countries is, is, is really, truly very, very important. The COVID-19 have told us the, about uh, the uh, importance of, of the inter interdependence between the countries, between research and the complementarities when we talk about science. And it's important to work together in order to have more efficient kind of process for the production of science. Thank you very much. Um, we also have uh, Professor Marie Claire joining us here. She is based in um, uh, U.S. State. So uh, good morning to you. Um, when we started this uh, this conversation, we were talking um, about uh, genetic uh, and genetics and technologies that can be used to improve people's health. So uh, how can we use genetic influence on diseases and how we can put it in a practical use? The, the way I think of this is really motivated by my first experience in India years and years ago, decades ago. And very early on, every young person in India was walking around with a cell phone. I still had my landline in my home. And it occurred to me, this country has skipped the landlines. 
and that's what I think we are trying to do here. We are trying to identify technologies that have already skipped the landlines, for which there's absolutely no point in, in recreating old technology, but situations in which intelligent, well-educated, motivated young scientists can grab new technologies and exploit them for important practical questions of the day. It doesn't in any way mean that new technologies don't need additional development. They do. But if we do our job right, we will have identified situations in which there are platforms that people can move forward with very productively. Um, WHO has so many of these activities in progress already that a great deal of what we may be able to do is to highlight some of the strengths of WHO in a whole variety of areas. Thank you so much. And do you think that artificial intelligence technologies can also be helpful? I think it's tempting to use um, words like artificial intelligence. Um, to be honest, I much more prefer human intelligence. I think what a young investigator can do armed with enough resources and enough uh, experimental reagents is just remarkable. Certainly at the level of moving massive amounts of data around, artificial intelligence is terrific. But I think we don't, want to, we don't want to lose sight of the prize, which is to bring modern technologies to bear on practical problems. Thank you so much. Um, here we have a next question for Professor Edit coming from our viewers. If you could please explain what is epigenetics? Okay, epigenetics um, is actually has many definitions. Um, there's one uh, side of the spectrum, which is how the environment in, impacts on individuals. Um, and so goes beyond genetics. Now, actually, that's not the definition that I like to use. I prefer to use a more conventional definition, which is that it's all changes in the way that our genome is expressed um, that are stable and heritable, but that don't involve any actual change in the sequences of our genomes. And so it's actually a topic that is very relevant to many different areas of life because it creates much more diversity uh, than pure genetic changes. Um, so I think in terms of uh, the WHO, epigenetics uh, actually embraces many, many of the areas uh, that are now at the forefront going from, you know, trying to, to help human health at the level of cancer, um, different... Uh, uh, predispositions to, to infectious diseases, right through to understanding how things like climate change are having an impact on the environment and then how that impacts on uh, life on Earth. So, so epigenetics is actually a, a very broad area um, and I work on a very specialized part of it. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work so that our viewers can understand this subject a bit better? Okay, um, very quickly, my, my topic of research is actually trying to understand how in women, in females, um, where there are two X chromosomes, one of the two X chromosomes becomes silenced in order to balance out um, what we have in males where they only have one X chromosome and one Y. So these sex chromosomes are a big challenge uh, for, for dosage. And so in women, one of the two Xs gets silenced and that is epi an epigenetic change. Basically the, the, the genome, the DNA sequence doesn't change at all, but the whole chromosome is um, put to silence. And then that's maintained stably throughout life. So that's what I work on. And I've spent um, more than 25 years trying to um, understand not only how it happens, but what the implications are, because it turns out that women are much more varied than men because of this um, X inactivation process, because sometimes we express our paternal X chromosome, sometimes a maternal X chromosome. So there's a lot of interest in, uh, for example, differences in disease susceptibility because of X inactivation. Thank you so much. This is uh, very interesting and thank you for, for explaining it for, for us. Um, I think I have a next question for all of our uh, panelists. What are some of the major scientific breakthroughs for human health in last years, in your opinion? Maybe, um, Dr. Harold, you would like to start as, as the chair. 
Well, it's a very large question because there have been so many. Uh, indeed, I, I'd argue that one of the things that we are focused on as a committee already has had a, a tremendously transforming ex experience in my own uh, area of interest, namely infectious disease and, and oncology, cancer research. And that is the development of techniques that allow us to look at individual genes and analyze them in great detail. Those were methods, uh, many of us were born uh, before we actually knew that information in cells was, was uh, encoded in DNA. And we've watched as we've gone from uh, absolute ignorance to uh, a, a level of understanding that is remarkable because we can now uh, uh, announce the complete genetic blueprint of every single organism on this earth simply by carrying out DNA sequencing methods and, and trying to understand the function of individual genes which are now um, uh, displayed in, in, in uh, extraordinary detail. And we've learned about uh, mutations that uh, do a variety of things like what's in the newspaper every day, change the behavior of viruses that are causing dread diseases around the world uh, to understanding why certain drugs don't work in certain individuals or why they fail to uh, uh, continue to suppress the growth of cancer cells because uh, the, the, the DNA sequence has changed. Um, so I, I would argue that uh, understanding DNA, how, it's, how is its information is expressed, how it changes uh, during evolution, how its expression changes as a result of some of the epigenetic events that Edith was talking about, uh, represent a, 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 a fundamental advance that is of great proportion. But I will defer to others to describe other things that have happened over the last uh, decade or two. Thank you so much. Uh, the next one on my screen is Dr. Salim. So what is the, the biggest science breakthrough for health in past years for you? Well, I'll just touch on infectious diseases. And in my view, I think the, the two big uh, discoveries in the last decade have focused around initially an antiretroviral treatment for HIV, where treatment was found to be effective not only in suppressing the virus, but also effective in preventing its onward transmission. So the, the value of antiretroviral treatment in saving lives and creating longevity, as well as uh, enhancing prevention, was really a major scientific contribution to one of the world's biggest health problems. And then, if I can add a, a, a second point, I think we've seen just amazing progress in the field of vaccines. We now have a vaccine for Ebola. We now have a vaccine for malaria. Admittedly, the malaria vaccine is not that good, but there's another one that's just you know, coming in, in, in line pretty soon that much, looks much better. And of course, we have an amazing vaccine and a set of vaccines for COVID-19. So I think what we're seeing is... is the whole vaccine field moving forward in leaps and bounds and opening up the door that may help us move much faster on an HIV vaccine as well. I would like Thank to come. You. I would please, like to come please. here. Yes, uh, for me, um, two, two big things in the past uh, couple of years or maybe almost a decade. One is of course gene editing, the ability to be able to edit genes and then, uh, you know, of uh, my, not just microorganisms, but plants and animals, including people. And this really, although it's a, a, a wonderful achievement, uh, it really creates a lot of moral and ethical problems that we still have to solve, you know, before we go on further, because, uh, you know, we cannot uh, really uh, go and edit genes of people without you know, knowing uh, whether it will have lasting effects on the future generations or not. So it's not a problem just for science, but it's a problem for ethics as well. So that's number one. Number two, I think this is neurotechnology. Uh, we have uh, really made many good advances in understanding how the neural system works and uh, in using them in uh, various, uh, you know, diseases, you know, neural diseases and other diseases and also in learning and understanding how people can learn and uh, you know various uh, changes that go on when when people 
learn and, and when dementia occurs. So this is something that is very exciting. And uh, in the next few years, I think we should see a lot of applications. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Adiba, what would be your, your answer? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that's going to revolutionize or that has already revolutionized healthcare is digital technology, um, like we're, we're utilizing it right now. This is, uh, you know, important for um, expanding access to rural areas, for instance, where there aren't enough specialists um, to provide, you know, specialist care. So having uh, like what Dr. King explained, you know, in India, everyone um, carries a mobile phone. Um, you know, I think uh, this, this is really telemedicine in the age of uh, COVID-19, um, we, you know, will provide hopefully um, the uh, much needed impetus for all of us to move to telemedicine um, that everyone has been trying to for decades, but now COVID-19 has forced us to do that and uh, hopefully will become part and parcel of uh, the healthcare delivery system. So I think um, digital technology um, will improve healthcare in leaps and bounds, not just from an AI point of view, but uh, you know, uh, capacity building, uh, knowledge dissemination. But on the flip side, as we know from um, the vaccine, uh, anti-vaccine movement and disinformation and misinformation with COVID-19, it's something that we also need to be to watch out for and, and have uh, you know, the ability to uh, combat all that through uh, misinformation through the so through social media. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Edith or uh, Marie Claire or Avla or Dr. Sumia, would you like to take a floor, please? Well, I could say a very quick word. Um, I think there's clearly been a, a revolution in for example, using uh, immune therapies. Um, so, you know, there are so many cancers that we can now treat. So I think that's one area that's completely exploded in the last 10 years. The question is, you know, how relevant will that be to the whole world? It's only us privileged um, people uh, who, who, who can actually have access to this. And I think this is for me the key. Maybe we should be going more towards understanding um, uh, diseases like cancer and in, in a sort of precision way, but for the whole world. And we really have the tools now, you know, the, the decades of research that have gone into uh, bringing us genomics or, or um, allowing us to create vaccines. There's so much research, so much knowledge now that we can use. And I really feel that we should be bringing some of these incredible therapies um, to, to the rest of the world. So I have uh, hope that with the WHO, we will be able to, to sort of uh, expand and help the world um, with these sorts of approaches. Thank you so much. I think that this is the moment we, when we all need hope um, as we are in this global crisis, but also hope for other health conditions um, that, that are affecting many, many people around the world. And you're rightly saying that access to these tools and scientific knowledge is actually important uh, to reach those people in, in need. Um, there, is a, there is a question actually coming from our viewer and maybe Dr. Sumia, you can take this one. When is the Science Council meeting again and what will be the next steps of your work? So obviously there's a lot of interest and we're very keen also that the Science Council um, you know, works in a way closely with WHO to really advance uh, all of these uh, uh, topics that we've been talking about. But, I think we're going to focus, the Science Council debated about this today and decided that perhaps they would focus on genomic technologies because that has a breadth of uh, influence across diagnosis, prevention and treatment, but also across uh, many, many disease areas. And you can't think of any area now currently where genomic technology could not have a bigger impact. And of course, we have to think about access and affordability. And as we said earlier, we have to think about tech, taking technologies to where the health problems are to solve them. So if it's going into an urban slum in a big city in, in Asia or, or, or Latin America and using uh, genomics to, to test the sewage water to see what pathogens are circulating or to set up surveillance systems to see if uh, you know, diseases 
which we think we don't have are re-emerging again, um, or whether it's being uh, used to uh, Dr. Mary Claire King's work is to identify people at high risk for you know, particular kinds of cancer so that you can then take preventive action. And, and so the, it has a huge uh, scope, but it, its full potential has not been realized in most parts of the world. So probably that's going to be the focus and the next, the, the Science Council is very keen to continue their work and not even wait for formal meetings. So I think we'll be having a lot of smaller group discussions and possibly the next meeting in June or July to come together again to make more concrete uh, the ideas that, that we would then like to pursue. But I think the area of genomics is clearly emerging as something that uh, has, has uh, also become very important during the pandemic, but has uh, applications way beyond uh, surveillance of pathogens. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumia. And the question that we quite often get from, from our viewers on social media is, how can we use the science and knowledge we have now to avoid next pandemic from happening? Dr. Salim, maybe you would want to start with this one? Yes, yeah, sure. I think uh, we've already started talking about this very issue at the Science Council meeting today. And Sumia has touched on this, which is, if we are to be well prepared for the future pandemics, uh, an initial first step is to be able to rapidly identify it. And so establishing uh, surveillance, ensuring we're using the latest technologies, that we're approaching it from a One Health perspective where we're looking at animal and human pathogens and their potential to, to, to spread and into a pandemic. I think all of those feature in this discussion. So I think we're gonna see uh, many new discussions and much uh, consolidation of our existing technologies and capabilities to enhance our preparedness for the next set of pandemics. Uh, I would like to add, uh, Yong Yut here, I would like to add to Dr. Abdul Karim that uh, uh, in addition to uh, surveillance, you know, we also have to be aware of, of various things that may, may uh, contribute to next pandemics. You know, we, we need to be aware of the environment, uh, the ecology, and uh, not just people, but the whole of nature. It could well be that climate change and other causes will contribute to the next pandemic. We don't know. And social factors are also very important, how people live and interact with one another, their occupation. These are all factors which influence uh, the status of health. So these factors can be important in the emergence of new pandemics. We, we should develop a new a kind of a science of pandemics, uh, preparedness, disease preparedness in the future. Thank you so much. Um, maybe before we close, as we have a couple of minutes uh, left, I will ask uh, Professor Marie Flair, um, as the question is coming from the audience for all, but I would start maybe with you. Uh, what was your motivation when you decided to study and work in science? I think for me, as a, as a young girl who was a child before the space age and didn't have any clue what a scientist did, as I, as I continued in school the, and, and learned more and more about what science could do, and ultimately took a course from a fabulous geneticist named Dr. Kurt Stern, the last time he taught it, the idea of being able to solve puzzles, the kinds of questions that people have been asking since people began to ask questions you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and now to be able to answer them with logic and with tools was irresistibly appealing. And the fact that this very distinguished teacher was so encouraging of me as a young, as a young student just made all the difference. And I began to do genetics and I have never looked back. Thank you so much. I would open the floor for other panelists as well to, to share the motivation to um, study and work in, in science. I may. Please, it's, please. For, for me, 
for me, science has been always from one question to the other. It's like a search and then research. And with each step, there was always second questions to be answered. And it somehow fit together like, like, like a tapestry of many threads. As uh, our colleague had just mentioned, it's like a puzzle and you have the joy when you find the, the solution or you, you find some, some results and findings from the science. Thank you so much, Professor Abla. Um, maybe I would give the floor to Professor Adiba next. Yeah, I think um, I, not specifically science, but I went into medicine and then later on went into research um, because I just enjoy working with people um, as opposed to numbers. <laughs> and. Uh, so that was what attracted me uh, to medicine, I guess. And from there, um, as I trained in medicine, just um, looking after patients alone, I felt wasn't enough. And that, you know, research, uh, medical research, clinical research was, uh, is, is very important to improve patient care. And I think that is what that continues to motivate me to do research as opposed to just um, uh, being a, a pure clinician. Thank you so much. And Professor Edith, what was your motivation? Yes, yeah, so um, I actually wanted to do astronomy when I went to university. Um, I'd never done any biology before I went to university. And when I got there and, and there was some amazing um, geneticists actually who inspired me, I realized that rather than, you know, gazing at the stars, life is so beautiful and so complex. So I, I did become fascinated by just trying to understand how living organisms work. And, you know, this was before, just before the time of genomics and all these amazing technologies we have now. And yet we could do so much. So it was this exploration of the diversity of life that got me into it. Um, and I think we're very lucky because in biology, we, we are constantly living revolutions um, and advances. And again, this pandemic has shown us, it's incredible how quickly we came up with a vaccine. I mean, you know, this, uh, even a few decades ago, that was unimaginable and here we are. So yes, the beauty of life on earth, that's what got me into it. Thank you so much. This is a very interesting story. Um, as, as we are having a ladies first here, I would give the floor to Dr. Sumia next, our chief scientist. For me also, it was the curiosity of, uh, of uh, trying to understand why certain things are happening. And uh, I w actually wanted to be a geneticist. First, I wanted to be a veterinarian, then I wanted to be a geneticist. And then I ended up in medical school and really enjoyed clinical care. But uh, as Adiba said, I thought it was not enough to just see patients and just treat as you've been taught how to treat. You, I always wanted to find out more why, why certain things are happening. And I think that's an area which we need to focus on more, especially in, in many countries around the world. Our teaching of, uh, of medicine, of life sciences needs to encourage people to ask the question why and not just take for granted what's written in the textbooks and what we are taught. And so I really started enjoying research uh, as part of my clinical career and then focused much more of my time to doing research. A disease like tuberculosis, you know, which has been there for, uh, well, thousands of years, it's been found in Egyptian mummies. So mycobacterium tuberculosis is, is a pathogen that humanity has lived with, and it still kills one and a half million people every year. And yet we, we haven't found a vaccine, we haven't found drugs, because we don't understand this organism, we don't understand the immune response yet. So there are still many, many questions uh, for diseases that kill a lot of people every year that we need to continue the research on. So that keeps me motivated. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Young Youth. What was um, your what was a driver for you to to start studying genetic engineering and biotechnology? Well, I think I think science attracts a lot of people, including me. Naturally, it came to me naturally. Back when I was a child, all things seemed so interesting. I would like to know more. Uh, however, it requires hard work and discipline, and uh, I think uh, many people cannot really kind of uh, stay with it, you know, uh, and attempt to understand the detail. 
So many people leave science, but all children are very fascinated by science and all things in nature. I think you need discipline. And uh, for me, I, I need to do some other things as well, not just science. <laughs> so uh, I cannot be you know, with science all the time. I, I really need to, to uh, talk to people and uh, you know, uh, listen to music and do various things as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, the scientists are doing other things as well, uh, not, not just the, the, the research. Um, Dr. Salim, um, the floor is yours. I have to go. So I think about why I went into science is actually more like who got me into science because I was heavily influenced by my high school physics teacher. He stimulated curiosity in me that you know, I just never really grasped until I went to uh, high school and came under his, his tutelage. But when I finished high school, I wanted to go and study engineering, but I, I was too poor and I couldn't afford it. But I got a scholarship to go and study medicine. So I went to, became a doctor by accident. But one of the most exciting things was when I was in medical school, I was mentored by a professor of pediatrics. And he taught me about rigor and he taught me about excellence. And he taught me about how curiosity and imagination is fundamental to good science. And so I have many people along the way to thank for where I've come to. And I think all of them contributed in their own way to the eventual final product today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Harold needs to, to leave us shortly. So I will give him the floor uh, as you. he close this, this session. Well, I'll be very brief, uh, but uh, my own path was somewhat different. I began my intellectual life as a a future professor of English literature, but along the way, I decided that I had to have some element of uh, public benefit in my work. I just chose to go to medical school to become a psychiatrist. Didn't like that very much. Um, then was obligated by the Vietnam War to serve my country, and I served my country by doing research at the NIH, where I learned uh, to um, the powers of science. I had medical school gone to India with the aspirations of helping people with current technologies, found them inadequate and decided based on my experience at NIH to spend my life working on, the, on basic biological problems that I thought uh, needed to be solved if we were going to advance global health. That is what I think this committee should be doing. Um, our aspirations is to harness, harness basic science, um, view the applications in a productive way and think about how we can make uh, the products of science accessible to everyone and uh, contributed to by all nations. With that, I must depart. Thank you very much, Alex, for running this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Harold. And I thank all our panelists and scientists, uh, not only for uh, joining this session, but for working with WHO and for committing to, to help us to bring science and scientific solutions closer to people around the world. Uh, we've received a lot of positive feedback on that this was very informative and inspirational conversation. So thank you. Uh, we look forward to learn more from you and to hear more from you. Um, I will just name a few countries that people were watching us from, starting from Sri Lanka, India, the US, Indonesia, Portugal, Uruguay, Bangladesh, Tajikistan, Argentina, Malaysia, Burkina Faso, Saudi Arabia, Iceland, Nigeria, Egypt, Philippines, Colombia, Cameroon, and many more. Um, so as we started this conversation that uh, science uh, knows uh, no um, nations, we had panelists from all over the world, but we also had people watching us from all over the world and um, listening uh, what, what are the, the greatest scientific achievements, but also what more is to come in future. Thank you so much and I wish you a um, good day. Thanks, Alex. Bye.